So for my protein project, I decided to do it on acetylcholine esterase, and that is the enzyme responsible for the degradation of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which is shown here. And this neurotransmitter serves the function of ending synaptic transmissions. Uh, the main function of acetylcholine is to carry motor impulses from nerve cells to muscle cells. Uh, when these motor nerve cells receive a signal from the brain, they release acetylcholine across its synapses with muscle cells. The uh, acetylcholine then interacts with receptors on the muscle cells, causing muscle contraction. The acetylcholine must then be rapidly degraded by acetylcholine esterase in order for the next impulse from nerve cells to have any effect on the muscle cells. So here's the structure of acetylcholine esterase. One of the main functions of acetylcholine esterase is the active site gorge, which you can see here. And this gorge is about 20 angstroms long and goes about halfway into the enzyme. At the bottom of the gorge is where the hydrolysis of acetylcholine esterase occurs. In the body, acetylcholine esterase exists mainly as a GPI anchored monomer, dimer, or tetramer to nerve and muscle cells. So seen here is the dimer of acetylcholine esterase, and this is sort of a simplified version to show how it is anchored to the lipid membrane of nerve or muscle cells, and each dimer is connected by disulfide bridges between the catalytic subunits. In human cells, the main form of acetylcholine esterase is its tetramer, which is seen here. However, most crystallization techniques have been on the monomer, and tetramerization of individual monomers has minimal effect on the enzyme's function, although in many enzymes, interactions between subunits play a larger role, which is in the case for acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase degrades acetylcholine into an acetate and a choline molecule, which can then re-enter nerve cells and be used to regenerate acetylcholine. So here's the mechanism for the degradation, which as you can see is similar to the chymotrypsin mechanism studied in class. With the initial attack by the serine residue on the carboxyl carbon, forming a tetrahedral intermediate, which is then cleaved by immediate attack by water. So let's look at the active site gorge in more detail. Like chymotrypsin, acetylcholine esterase is a serine hydrolase. And due to the need to rapidly degrade acetylcholine, it's one of the most efficient enzymes in the body, with its catalytic efficiency approaching the rate of substrate diffusion. So at the bottom of the acrosite gorge, which is what we're looking at right now, is the catalytic triad of acetylcholine esterase. Um, this contains three crucial residues, serine 200 right here, which we can see is covalently bonded to acetylcholine esterase, uh, histidine 440, seen here, which removes a proton from serine, making it more nucleophilic. And lastly, we have a glutamate residue, which is contrast to the aspartate residues normally found in serine hydrolases. But uh, this serves the same function as it hydrogen bonds to histidine, making it a better base and keeping it in place. Like other hydrolases, acetylcholine esterase contains an oxyanion hole as glycine residues, uh, 119 and 118, and alanine residues, 201, stabilize the oxyanion intermediate, as we saw in the reaction mechanism. So the positively charged choline is stabilized through interactions with this tryptophan, 84 residue, which makes up the anionic hole of the gorge. Um, this is important for stabilizing the choline and holding the acetylcholine in place in the active site. So one of the more interesting features of the active site gorge is the large number of aromatic residues that line the gorge. And these uh, residues are highly conserved across species, and there are approximately 14 that line the gorge. Um, they function to provide low affinity binding sites for acetylcholine as it enters the gorge, and these binding sites help guide the neurotransmitter to the catalytic triad once the neurotransmitter is at the mouth of the gorge.
So one of the questions the structure of acetylcholine esterase raises is how do the products of the hydrolysis of acetylcholine leave if the efficiency of the enzyme is so high? So as you can see from this structure, it appears that the only way the products could leave the enzyme is by diffusing back up the gorge, which would definitely interfere with acetylcholine molecules entering the active site. Acetylcholine esterase overcomes this problem by the movement of two crucial residues, tyrosine 442 and tryptophan 84, which was involved in the anionic hole of the enzyme. So tyrosine 442 and tryptophan 84 are joined by hydrogen bond, which is broken during catalysis. And this allows tyrosine and tryptophan to both rotate its conformation, creating a backdoor exit for the products of, of hydrolysis. This plays a large role in, in explaining the effectiveness of the enzyme's activity as it effectively controlled by the diffusion of substrate into the active site of the enzyme, with the hydrolysis products leaving the active site immediately. So this figure highlights exactly how the tyrosine 442 residue rotates to create this backdoor exit for the hydrolysis products. And as you can see, it's blocked, but with the rotation, there's a convenient little exit for the products to leave the enzyme. Acetylcholine esterase is relevant to a variety of neurological diseases and has been the target of many pharmaceutical drugs as well as toxins. In particular, acetylcholine and acetylcholine esterase have been identified as a major component in the diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. It has been proposed that Alzheimer's disease is caused by a decrease in the production of acetylcholine in nerve cells, as well as the decrease in the number of acetylcholine receptors. Acetylcholine esterase inhibitors have sought to limit the effects of Alzheimer's disease. Acetylcholine is only released when its concentration in the synaptic cleft is low. Thus, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors cause accumulation of acetylcholine in the cleft. An important biological effect of neurons are producing low amounts of acetylcholine. The nepazil, which is seen here, is one of the first FDA-approved treatments to treat Alzheimer's disease. The nepazil is a mixed inhibitor of acetylcholine esterase, interacting with the many aromatic residues in the active site gorge of the enzyme. Thus, it can compete with acetylcholine for access to the active site by blocking the gorge, as well as by binding to a different location than that of the active site. In normal neurological function, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors cause too much accumulation of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, and this accumulation stops nerve impulses from being transmitted. Organophosphates are extremely toxic to humans as they are irreversible inhibitors of acetylcholine esterase and some have been used as nerve gases. In particular, sarin, which is shown here, was used during World War I as a chemical weapon. So these organophosphates act by covalently bonding to the serine residue of the catalytic triad. In the normal hydrolysis of acetylcholine, the covalently bound oxygen to the acyl group is liberated immediately by the attack of a water molecule, producing an acetate ion and the free enzyme. However, organophosphates form biologically stable phosphoesters, which is seen here, which renders the, act, the enzyme inactive. The inactive acetylcholine esterase will cause acetylcholine to accumulate, and people poisoned with sarin die from asphyxiation, as they are unable con to control the muscles involved in breathing. I hate to end on a dim note, but that's all I got. I hope you enjoyed my video on acetylcholine esterase. Thanks.